now. Thank you. Thanks for having me here. Um, so my name is Aurélie Desmet. I'm a researcher and teacher at the uh, Faculty of Architecture of the K. Leuven University in Belgium. And I'll be presenting on behalf of my co-authors, which are Burak Pak and Yves Schoenjans and Sarah van Tornhout, also from the university, and Geraldine Brunil and Tineke van Heesvelde from um, the nonprofit organization SAM, Living Sobo, and Kende Koeman from the BC Architects Company. So the presentation will be um, on how architectural design service learning can be a critical spatial practice. Bringing together socio-spatial modes of practice, academia and society through a transformative combination of participatory design, reflective practice and living lives. This will be discussed through the study of the Solidary Mobile Housing Project which is an ongoing practice-based research project at the K. Leuven Faculty of Architecture in Belgium. So in this presentation, I will first elaborate a bit more on the research project itself before explaining how teaching and learning were addressed in the context of this project. And then we will briefly construct a theoretical framework, which we will then use to critically revisit the project. Finally, we will draw some conclusions, highlight some challenges um, in this context, and formulate some potential future directions. So first, um, a few words about the project. In the framework of this case, several partners, academia, society, and practice have been collaborating intensively with each other through a participatory action research in a living lab context that was started up in 2017. The project aim was to develop, test, and refine a model for increasing urban resilience through the co-creation and co-management of mobile houses for the houseless on urban waiting spaces in the Brussels capital region. So the research questions of the project were, how can vacant areas be temporarily be used as sites for housing or co-create intermediate housing for the houseless in Brussels? Moreover, in the context of this presentation, I will also highlight what the potential role of K. Leuven researchers and students was and is in this era. As you can see here, the partners in the project were first and foremost eight end users. They are houseless people from the Brussels capital region, and they are the future inhabitants of Egypt. As illustrated in this image, they are literally being placed at the heart of the project. Surrounding them are researchers and students from the Faculty of Architecture of the K. Leuven and employees of the nonprofit organizations Centrum voor Algemeen Welzijnswerk and Sam and Living Sobau Brussel, focusing uh, respectively on individual well being and neighborhood work. Around those are more operational actors, like the Brussels architectural firm BC Architects, the social construction firm Casablanco the non-profit organization Atelier Groot Eiland, working on professional insertion, and the Brussels municipality of Jette, where the project is being built. Finally, there are also more remotely involved actors around those, for example, the surrounding inhabitants and neighborhood organizations, and the local and lo sublocal authorities. As the result of the project, after four years, the partners co-created the Solidary Mobile Housing Model which incorporates on the one hand a co-creation method involving social guidance processes, skill building and university collaboration methods, a financial balance sheet for the prototype, neighborhood integration and temporary use negotiation, negotiation strategies, and preliminary strategies for the integration in the existing planning and governance codes and operation in the current legal framework of the Brussels capital region. On the other hand, the model also includes powering design solutions and technologies embodied in a design prototype consisting of eight mobile and modular housing units and a collective space surrounded by a semi-public landscape. Here you can see for the configuration of the project on an urban waiting space in the municipality where, as I said, the prototype is constructed. The collective space, which you can see on the left-hand side, is on the one hand aimed at facilitating the communal life and mutual solidarity within the group, 
On the other hand, it will also serve to organize activities, encouraging encounter and interaction between the solidary mobile housing inhabitants and other people like neighborhood residents, students, and their family members. The outdoor space surrounding the individual units and collective spaces are currently being co-designed with the inhabitants as a semi-public landscape. The Solidary Mobile Housing Living Lab thus aimed at creating a learning environment involving all the partners, including the houseless, in the entire research process. The hypothesis behind this, this is that by collectively taking part in every step of the conceptualization, construction, and later on exploitation of their own houses, these people would be empowered not only to participate in the co-creation of individual housing units, but also to gradually solidary living community in interaction with their surrounding neighborhood. And that through this, they will be able to regain, regain a grip not only on their own housing situation, but also on their whole life. From 2017 to today, several students have also been involved in the Solidary Mobile Housing Project via research-driven, community-engaged architectural design service learning. The first students were involved was through an elective organized by the Urban Project, Collective Spaces and Localities Research Group. It, was, um, it took place during the co-planning phase of the project. And in the framework of this course, the students worked together with the project partners on writing the design brief through a needs and requirements analysis and through case studies, on developing a temporary use site discovery and selection method, scenario development. The second time the students were involved was through a design studio. This one was organized during the co-design phase of the project. In the framework of this course, the students worked together with all the partners, including the future inhabitants, on the preliminary design of the, of the houses, the collective space, and the semi-public landscape. Then the third time the students were involved was still during the co-design phase through another elective organized by the building construction group this time, they worked on further detailing the design. Again. Finally, the fourth time students were involved was during the co-development phase. Within the framework of yet another elective, this time organized by the Altering Practices for Urban Inclusion Research Group, the students worked on helping to kick off the neighborhood integration through a number of temporary interventions on the site. And they also reflected on the longer term development and positioning of the Solidary Mobile Housing Project through the study and comparison of similar cases from Belgium and abroad. With the aim of constructing a conceptual framework for the analysis of this project, we will now make a background discussion. In this presentation, we will have to keep this limited due to time restrictions, but it will be addressed in more detail in written. However, I want to start quite generally by pointing out the difference between mode one and mode two knowledge production. As opposed to mode one knowledge production in which the researchers are all too often seen as detached from reality, mode two knowledge production recognizes that reality is always open, complex, networked and dynamic. And that as a result, action is never the realization or the implementation of a plan, but the exploration of the unintended consequences and provisional and revisable version of a project. Therefore, mode two knowledge production is, as Let expresses it, about moving from science to research, from objects to projects, and from implementation to experimentation. To realize this and to be able to cope with the high complexity of reality and formulate efficient answers to the contemporary challenge, it is important that academia, practice and society would collaborate dynamically and structurally with each other. This is also expressed in the service learning model, which situ situates service learning at the intersection of practical experience, civic engagement and academic. However, although collaboration amongst two of these spheres 
exceptional of three of them seems to be less common. For constructing our theoretical framework, we will therefore zoom in on some of the modes of collaboration between two of these spheres at a time. For the first type of cross-sphere collaboration, we are zooming in on participatory design, which is bringing together practice and society. Participatory design arose in Scandinavia in the 60s and 70s, and it was rooted in the work with trade unions aimed at involving the workers in improving their own work situation. At that time, it was often called cooperative design. Today, it is applied in, in various disciplines as an approach to design that attempts to actively involve stakeholders in the design process with the aim of ensuring that the designed product would meet the stakeholders' needs and is usable. In the context of participatory design, end users are seen as the experts of their own experience. The second type of cross-sphere collaboration we are zooming in on is reflective practice, which is bringing together practice and academia. Reflective practice is the ability to reflect on one's actions so as to engage in a pro process of continuous learning. This concept emerges principally from the work of Donald Schoen, who was one of the first to draw the attention to the crisis in the professions, often represented by the perceived gap between formal theory and actual practice. Reflective practice involves paying critical attention to the practical values and theories which inform everyday actions by examining practice in a reflective and reflexive way. Here, rationale behind reflective practice is that experience alone does not necessarily lead to learning, but that deliberate reflection on experience is essential for learning. Finally, the third type of cross-sphere collaboration we are zooming in on is living labs, bringing together academia, practice, academia and practice. In literature, it is possible to find various approaches to living labs. Different researchers have described it from different perspectives as networks, platforms, a context, a method, an interface, or a system. Specific for living labs is that products and services are being tested and developed in their real environment. An interaction with users is a prerequisite. As a result, the method used in living labs is iterative. We will now use this framework to reanalyze the Solidary Mobile Housing Project. We will focus our critical reflection more specifically on, on the analysis of the methods and tools used for enabling transdisciplinary collaboration and architectural design service learning. A first step in this was that we organized the architectural design service learning courses as testing grounds for phenomena, methods, and tools. Our approach, based on what is themed live projects in architectural pedagogy, includes the staging of reorganized relationships, involving not only the students, teachers, and researchers, but also several architectural and social practitioners, as well as the end users in the research and teaching activities. As a result, we help to develop not only the architectural students, but also all the other participants' skills and talents as well as our own. And we managed to combine a critical rethinking of all involved disciplines with, uh, to combine this with the production of a new body of recognizable work. As such, the Solidary Mobile Housing Life Project could be seen as a specific transformative type of living lab, as it is bringing together not only research and society, but also teaching and practice. Another specificity of the project is that as a result of the circular and incremental participatory action research project, all the partners are at all times closely involved in the transdisciplinary and transsectoral reflection in action and reflection on action mode of working. This results in what Marcus Miesen is calling cross-benching practices. These are pushing participants to go off autopilot and critically address the established protocols and codes of conduct in their specific fields and to establish new transdisciplinary and transsectoral protocols through practice. 
As such, through this cross-benching practice, the Solidary Mobile Housing Project is pushing reflective practice also to involve other actors, which would previously have been considered as uninvolved outsiders. Five minutes, please. Thank you. Finally, another specificity of the Solidary Mobile Housing Project revolves around participation not only in the design process, but also through the design product. On the one hand, participation in the design process focuses on design before use through the design of methods, media, and tools for facilitating participation during the co-creation of the design, such as the user inquiries we made at the beginning of the project and which helped us to get an insight in the needs, daily practices, and skills of potential users before the engagement of the future inhabitants or the participatory site visits, which enabled us to see the site through the eyes of the vulnerable users, or the participatory hands-on workshops, which empower the users and students to engage in hands-on making activities. And finally, also the participatory reviews and evaluations, which provided the chance to all the participants to engage in design conversations. On the other hand, in the participation through design approach, architecture itself is seen as an infrastructure for participation, empowering the users to make and remake their own living environments. This approach rethinks architecture as an ever-changing, incomplete and open infrastructure and focuses on design in use, such as adaptation, appropriation and tailoring and redesign. Following this principle of participation through design, we co-created a system of modular building elements consisting of a multifunctional unit, a technical unit, and interchangeable facade panels and flexible reusable internal wall panels, which the, user are, the users are learning to assemble and disassemble so that they can combine them to generate an almost endless amount of open plan layouts. As a result, the building system is, emp system is empowering the users to make and remake their own homes not only during the design process, but also after the completion of the project. As such, this participation in and through design is transforming participatory design into also including research and innovation, as well as skill building elements. I realize that I only have been able to offer you a very brief insight into this broad, multi-layered and complex project. But as we have limited time left, let's go straight to the conclusions in which I want to highlight again how the transformational approach of the Solidary Mobile case using architectural design, service learning, combining participatory in, uh, participation in and through design, live project, and cross-benching practice fostered critical spatial practice, which in Marcus Meisen's terms involves critically addressing the established code of conduct and setting new protocols to true practice as well as seeing research as practice and rec recognizing the agency of the artifact. As such, the use of architectural design service learning in the context of this project also forwarded the notion of spatial agency introduced by Jeremy Till as another way of doing architecture, and in this way reframing the role of the architect as well as of the other actors involved. As this is an emerging practice, the challenges are still great. They range from practical and financial, such as having to deal with legal responsibilities and finding funding to build, over disciplinary and institutional, such as having to develop a common vocabulary and a common understanding of notions, such as social inclusion and spatial quality, to ethical, such as dealing with openness and incompleteness and the involvement of vulnerable users. These challenges re require all the participants to leave the safe zone of the well-known and move from a culture of consensus towards an acceptance of these senses. Finally, potential future directions might be for academia to focus on deepening the understanding of research as a practice, for practice to allow a reframing of the role of professionals as cross-benching practitioners and co-creators in cross-sectoral collaborations, and for society to keep on investing time and effort in participation in and through co-design. In this way, we believe it might be possible to bring together socio-spatial modes of practice, academia, and society in a more durable and perpetual manner in the future. Thank you. <laughs>